So I want to preface this by saying today that I'm drawing heavily from uh, the work of a woman named Dr. Amy Kinney. She is uh, a disability scholar and theologian. Um, she's a disabled person who has a, a neurological condition that affects her ability to walk. Um, she, she says it, she has a withered leg and uh, she's uh, written a book called My Body is Not a Prayer Request. Um, wet, in which she, she talks about her journey with disability. Um, she talks about disability access in the wider society, but she also spends a lot of time talking about disability in the church. I, um, you may know that churches are excluded from aspects of the Americans of, with Disabilities Act. And what I didn't know that I learned in this book is that there were, um, when that act was passed, there were religious organizations that argued against being required to live up to those standards on the basis that it would violate their religious freedom. So it's, an, it's another one of those things where the church has not, and of course we speak generally, we don't mean every church, but the church as a whole has not followed in the way of Jesus. So all of that's to say that I, I'm drawing heavily from her ideas in this sermon today. This story about the man born blind is a pretty familiar one. It's a miracle story, right? And miracle stories are the shiny stories in scripture that uh, we hear in Sunday school when we're kids and that the preacher will pull out to testify to the uh, omnipotent power of God. The story starts with this question about, um, from the disciples to Jesus, about whether the man is blind because he sinned or his parents. It's an odd anachronistic question for us here in the 21st century. I hope that you, whenever you see a blind person, your first question is not, what did they do wrong? But the question evokes a common belief in ancient cultures that sickness and disability was the result of somebody's wrongdoing. Jesus doesn't waste any time correcting this misconception. In fact, he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Dr. Kinney makes a really interesting interpretive turn at this point in the story. The classical interpretation is that the man was born blind so he could be cured, so that he could demonstrate the power of God. But the text doesn't say that he was born to be cured so that he might reveal God's works. The text says that he was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Dr. Kinney makes a distinction in her interpretation between cure and healing. Yes, it is a miracle that the blind man was cured. <laughs> 
But Dr. Kinney suggests that the real healing in the story is Jesus' embrace of a disabled person, drawing him into community, dispensing of the notion that he is blind because of sin. And she draws out this interpretation by pointing to the fact that even after Jesus cures the blind man by restoring his physical sight, he is still not restored to his community. The religious leaders who are suspicious of Jesus healing on the Sabbath and threatened by his power and influence continue to ostracize and marginalize the formerly blind man. This time, not because he's blind, but by rejecting his newfound vision for what is possible in the kingdom of God. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins. Are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Even after the formerly blind man has been cured, the religious leaders do not think they have anything to learn from him because he sees things differently than they do. This is the real sin of these religious folk, that they can't see past their harmful ideologies and rigid rules and traditions to perceive the new thing that God is doing. But the blind man sees, and I suspect he saw more clearly in a way than they did even before he was cured. Not so much with the eyes in his head, but with the eyes in his heart. As you know, we have somewhat of a disability expert here in our congregation, Dr. Carolyn, uh, not doctor, but Carolyn Thompson. Recently, Carolyn said to me, you know, there are a lot of similarities between racism and ableism. And I started trying to kind of, kind of tease that out and quickly, it didn't take long to think of a few ways. They both rely on a hierarchy of bodies that some bodies are more valuable or more desirable or more normal than others. They both end up putting up barriers to access to certain groups of people. This has been done historically in very literal ways uh, we think about segregation as a barrier to participation. We think about inaccessible buildings as a barrier to participation. But even when the literal or legal barriers are not there, often people who are disabled and people who are of a variety of races and ethnicities are not heard in the same way in communities as people who are white-bodied and able-bodied. Racism and ableism are similar in the sense that they are systems in which we are socialized. So you don't have to be a person who 
a white person who hates people of other races or an able-bodied person who hates disabled people to have some racist ideas or some ableist ideas because it is the culture into which we are socialized. Think about this uh, pulpit for a moment. Years ago, we made some strides in making the sanctuary more accessible. But the pulpit is still not accessible. So sometimes what we'll do is, if a person cannot manage the stairs, they're allowed to preach here from the floor. But what does that say about who we imagine can be the preacher? We don't imagine that a preacher might be disabled. What we do do a lot in religious communities is use disability as a metaphor. That great hymn that we love to sing, Amazing Grace. I once was blind, but now I see. We talk about blindness as some kind of spiritual affliction. In American culture, when a person doesn't really know what to say or what to do, they might say that they feel paralyzed. If they're feeling really held back or trapped in a situation, they might say they feel crippled. All of these are ways that we use disability as a metaphor, most likely not meaning any harm. But for people who are quite literally blind or paralyzed or crippled, these things are not metaphor. In popular culture, Disability is often seen as the hallmark of something evil, or at the very least, tragic. Think about all the movies or TV shows that involve a villain whose face is deformed, or uh, they maybe have a, a mobility disability, and it's often even weaved into the plot line that their own bitterness about their disability has turned them against the rest of the world. But in scripture, so very often, the mark of an encounter with God is a disability. A couple of weeks ago, I preached about Jacob and Esau. Later on in the narrative, after the story that we looked at a few weeks ago, you might remember that Jacob has an encounter with a divine messenger. An encounter that he very intentionally limps away from. He is wounded by his wrestling with the divine. Oddly enough, though, in depictions that I have seen of Jacob, you don't usually see him with any sort of cane or mobility assistance device, but the scripture says that uh, the the dietary practices of the people of Israel changed to remind them of the father of their people and his disability. 
Think about the Apostle Paul, who was blinded on the road to Damascus in order that he too might catch a new vision for what was possible in the kingdom of God. Paul talks later on in his letters about the thorn in his flesh, and none of us really know what that is. Maybe it was a disability. Moses had a speech impediment of some kind, and yet he was called to go and demand to Pharaoh that he let the Hebrew people go. Scripture also says that Moses was, was accompanied by Aaron and Miriam so that he didn't have to make those demands alone. This brings us back to John's Gospel and the story of the blind man. In the Christian life, the goal is not sight. It's vision. A vision for a kind of community in which the blind and all disabled people which, as I mentioned, will most likely be all of us one day, are set free from condemnation and isolation. And this is the really radical idea that Dr. Amy Kinney proposes. Not only are the disabled set free from condemnation, but the able-bodied are set free from the fear of disability. What we are aiming for in the Christian life is not a cure for everything that ails us, but a community in which we can be made whole through the medicine of belonging. That medicine is what Dr. Kinney calls the vibrant goodness between us. And it's this grace that flows freely among us when we realize that we need each other. Not just that we like each other or choose to be with each other, but that we are interdependent, whether we always like it or acknowledge it or even sometimes run from it. Dr. Kinney says that people with disabilities exist on the other side of the myth of independence. because so much of uh, their ability to function in a world that is not designed for disability relies on the assistance of other people. Rather than talking about this as a tragedy, she claims it as a kind of liberation. She says she learned early on that she could not live her life independently. And what a gift that has been to free her from the notion that her value is somehow determined by her productivity or efficiency. This is a challenging word of grace. But it is grace. In a moment, we're going to sing, sing the hymn Amazing Grace with some refreshing new lyrics. You probably remember the old first verse. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Hear these new words from Jacob Nault, who is a musician and a person who has cerebral palsy. Amazing grace, how good that I'm forgiven, loved, and free. All that I am is blessed by God, who made each part of me. Many people with disabilities describe the process that they go through to live in acceptance of their disability. Not so much because of their own internal issues with it, but often because of how it has been interpreted to them by the wider world. To know that all we are is blessed by God. This is the good news. For those of us who are disabled and for those of us who are temporarily able-bodied. So let us receive this word of grace and stand together and sing Amazing Grace. <laughs>